Well, glory to God, saints. We're going to talk about something that I know and God knows that you need, and that's courage. Oh, somebody, let me say it again. Courage. You need courage. You've been doing some things, and it just haven't been quite right. But God says you're going to learn how to have courage with him. Oh, I'm here to tell you, saints, this is so good. Because even as he was doing this for me, oh, somebody, I was gaining courage. I was gaining insight as to what he really wanted for me. And I began to think about things, and I began to learn of a new purpose that he had for my life. Oh, somebody, but this is, somebody say right now that this is for you. Because you've been lacking in some areas, and I'm here to tell you to take courage. Oh, somebody. Let's jump right in, amen. We prayed, God has spoken, so let's just jump right in to this. Now, let me talk about courageous fellowship, because that's what you must have with the Lord. A courageous fellowship, but what does a courageous fellowship mean? Oh, somebody. A courageous fellowship is built on the foundation of a courageous relationship. Oh, this is so good. I'm getting excited even before I get going here. We're going to talk about and define what a courageous fellowship is, but it, we understand that it's built on the foundation of a courageous relationship. Deuteronomy, we know we, 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 we talk about Deuteronomy, but my Deuteronomy simply tells me to do the right thing, run me. If I do the right thing, oh, somebody, then it's going to be well with me. But if I do the wrong thing, I'm going to be cursed. Saints of God, we're going to do the right thing. So let's go to Deuteronomy 31 and 6. And keep in mind the courageous fellowship. And where's that fellowship coming from? It's coming from the Lord. We're going to learn how to fellowship with the Lord and be courageous about it. And I will call your attention to the screen because it talks about staying strong. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6 says, be strong then. And when I was looking at that word, I stopped and I thought about the word that Pastor Darlene gave last week. How in, on earth can I be strong? How can you be strong, you say, when I'm going through some things? But he says, be strong and be of good courage. Well, I understand and got the courage part, but how do I be strong? Well, I've got to learn to soar, somebody. I've got to learn to take heart. Hallelujah. And I was looking at that depiction or representation that how the eagle is perfectly, I say perfectly designed. If you look at an eagle's wing, you see that it's designed to fly. But how can you be strong in that? Being strong is having a belief that the currents, oh, somebody, the currents of the air, the airways themselves, they are there. How do we know that? How can an eagle fly and be gliding the way he does and be designed to, to, to fly like that? And then we notice that an airplane is designed based on the structure or the prototype of that eagle. But to be strong, we must take heart and faith. That's what being strong is. So, but God says, be strong then. Be strong and of good courage. Then he says, right after that, fear not. Fear not and be not afraid. Be not afraid of who? Them. Who are, who are them? Them is your enemy. Them are your persecutors. God says, be not afraid of them. Fear not. And why does he say that? I said, well, God, okay. He says, be not afraid of them. I, I, I understand now who they are. For the Lord says, for the Lord thy God, he it is that doeth go with thee. So in other words, God says, you're going to be strong because I'm going to have a current. I'm going to have the necessary platform, <clears throat> the foundation, 
for you to be strong in. So take courage now and walk with me, he says. He says, God, it is that doeth, goeth with thee. He goes with who? You. He will not fail you. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now that is enough to close the book because you can take courage knowing this. You know, we say all the time, when you know that you know and you know, you know that you now, God is with you. You're looking around trying to find him, but he's with you. So he says then, be strong and of good courage, not bad courage, but of good courage. And you say, pastor, that's all well and good, but I'm still quite not there yet. But hang on, I wanna talk to you about a good follower, somebody, a believer. A believer or a good follower should orbit, I say, around the leader's purpose. Who are we talking about? God's. Because the purpose is clear and motivating. Be careful not to align or pursue or perceive self-interest when it comes to God. There it is. There's always a common interest when you let Jesus lead. Oh, man, that's good. See, when you submit yourself to God, we know what the word says. So a good follower then, or the believer should orbit, orbit around the leader's purpose, because the purpose is a clear motivator. And then therefore, don't get into self-interest because God is the one that's going to lead you. When we follow the leader of Jesus, we can begin to line up and take courage. Let me give you a, a further example, maybe one that you can relate to because God is our leader and he defines us in this manner. You know, I had to look up this morning what Habakkuk is, and I had to look up the vision, the mission, the value, and the purpose of what we're doing here. So again, you may want to write this down because some of you see a lot of this in corporate America. And let's define and look at vision for a minute. What is your vision? Well, let me define what a vision is. A vision says, where are you going? Where are you going? That's your vision. Make this personal this morning. You understand that the world corporations, large corporations have vision. Habakkuk, we have a vision that God gave us. So the vision is then is where are you going? Think about that for a minute. So your own personal vision this morning would be where am I going? What is, what is my direction? Where am I going? You should be asking yourself that and relate that to the word vision. The next word would be mission. What is your mission then? Well, let me define mission because you need to write this down because it's so important in your life today. Your mission then is how will you get there? How will you get to where you're going? Notice how this ties in with the word of God. Where are you going? How will you get there? We talked about the vision, where we're going, the mission, how will we get there? Well, then values then would be the next one. The value is your behavior. Oh, somebody, this is no time to misbehave. Your behavior in your plight must count for something you must not. Allow yourself to be deviated by the enemy. You must be strong and courageous in this. So then your values then is your rule of engagement, how you handle the situation, how you behave. Oh, somebody. Then your purpose, I say, is what do you do when you get there, when you arrive? The answer to that is, is God. When we begin to let God in and let him lead, the purpose then is revealed. Now, let me walk you through those. Imagine your vision in the morning. 
Your vision is to get to wherever you're going. Some of you may have to still get up and drive to work, or if you're non commuting, then you still have to get up and do the necessary things, wash your face, brush your teeth. You're going somewhere. That's your vision. You're on your way somewhere where you're going. The next one is how you get there. Well, there are steps that you take to get there, right? You're, you have to do things, turn the computer on. Again, if you're working from home, set your face. If you're working from home, do the necessary things to be in order so that when the screen comes on, you're in place. How you get there. Before you turn that knob, how you got there is your mission. But here's the big one, your value. How will you represent yourself? How will you behave yourself? If you are commuting to work, how will you behave on the way? Your behavior, will you be a road warrior or a road rage? Oh, somebody. How will you behave if someone cuts in front of you? How will you behave? Your values should stand out this time with Jesus. Then once you arrive, what will you do Will you, when you get there, will you work unto the Lord? Will you stand firm and trust him so that the purpose, I say the purpose of God will be revealed in your life. So then now you have knowing what you need to set your life in order. Again, I could close the book there, but it gets better, saints of God. Let's apply some word to it so that then it will become meaningful. This is why I said you needed to buckle up and begin to write this down because this is your personal life. Joshua 1 and 7 then, Joshua 1 and 7, it talks about when God told Joshua. Look what he, God told Joshua, chapter 1, verse 7. We know this. He says, only be strong. There it is again. Your, your stream says, stay strong. Oh, somebody. When you stay strong, you got to think of how you soar. You, you're soaring on a wave. You're, you're, you're in a place. You set your place like the eagle, right? You're, you're, you're gliding, but how do you remain in that sphere? How on earth is the eagle able to fly like that? The airways are already there. God put it in place. So I had to think about it. I looked at that picture, and I, I thought about Pastor Darling's word, and it really touched my heart. Hallelujah. As she mentioned, you need to go back and listen to it. Also, this one will be out there. I'm telling you, saints, people are, are, are buying into this. They, they're, 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 they're looking at, they're viewing. Hallelujah. God wants us to soar. Hallelujah. He wants your life to change and, and be as that eagle who flies. But the wing of that eagle, I can't let that go. It's so designed. It's, it's perfect. It's perfect. His feathers, it, it, it has points in it and how it does what it does. It's amazing to me how God does these things, but this is how he does with our life. This is what he does. This is what he does. Joshua 1 and 7 talks about it. He says, only be thou strong then. Now we understand being strong, but be courageous. A courageous fellowship is the foundation of a courageous relationship. So if you're fellowshipping with God, you are in the mix of what's going on. You are understanding that you have a relationship. You understand that you have a communication with God. And of course the fellowship, and then there's a communion with him, a worship with him. Notice, I said buckle up. The word again says, only be thou strong and very courageous. And I notice in this word, in the King James Version, I become somewhat very, very unique, or I've become very attentive to commas. As you know, Gramlin, I use that a lot. A lot of you use Gramlin too when you do, when you have to write a lot. And the commas, Gramlin is always trying to put a comma behind my words and before and. So I've become very attentive to commas. And the word has those same commas. So I must pause, right? To stop and reveal what God is trying to say. Don't run through the word, dissect the word, amen? 
So he says, only be thou strong and very courageous. And he pauses there with a comma. He wants us to do this. He, he wants us to think about being strong. But now we understand about being courageous. We having a foundation. Notice the foundation that God lays for us to what? Soar on the airways. So then he says, be thou strong and very courageous that thy mayeth, mayeth observe to do according to all, all the law. I'm here to tell you the fruits of the spirit trumps the law, but back in the patriot days, in the times of Moses, the law was the book. The law was simply the Bible today. So then the law was very significant in the patriot's time. So then he says again, that thy may observe to do according to all the Bible says. Moses, he says, what's thy Moses, my servant, commanded thee. God gave Moses the commandments to command these to the people of God, to us. Turn not from it, he says, to the right hand or to the left. Don't look to the left nor to the right. Notice, saints of God, this is what we do, and I've talked to you about church people. When we go in church, we need to go in straight face. Our face needs to be like a flint. I've watched some ministers in the past who follows this paradigm. Their face is always about the business of God. When you walk into the ministry, your face should be set like a flint. It should be one directional, and that's to God. Because if you look to the left or to the right, you may see something that will distract you. For the ladies, they may be wearing a skirt that's too short. For the men, they may be wearing a shirt that's too tight. Or they just might not be appropriate in terms of the dress. They may be in poverty and they're trying to get help. There could be a lot of reasons, but you are being distracted because God has no respect of persons. You are supposed to pray for all people. We are to love all people. God has always had me to repeat. When I feel a certain way about a person, this is what I do. I go straight to the Beatitudes, saints of God. I say, love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy enemy. Hallelujah. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Notice here, this is how I handle when I don't know how to pray. This is because I know God wants us to pray for all his people. He wants us to stand in the gap for our families and for his people. So then don't look to the left nor to the right, he says. He says, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left hand. He says that thy may, mayeth prosper. Oh, somebody, there pastor go again talking about prosperity. Oh, somebody, I got to talk about it until the cows come home. <laughs> but it's good. It's what God wants us to be. He, he says it in his word constantly. He says again, let me repeat that. Turn not to the left. When you're not distracted, you can stay on point. You can be strong and of good courage. Turn not from the right hand or to the left. That thy mayeth prosper wherever so thy goeth. So wherever you go, you're supposed to prosper if you're following the courageous fellowship of God. Look at, look at the saint. This is something you want to write down, too, about courage. Take courage in what you're doing. Notice we talked about these values and missions and, and, and all of those things because that's important for you to have. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So he says, then, the courage to be a good courage in fellowship. Notice, if you wrote down already the vision for you, for you, for you, somebody say for me, where you're going, your mission, your value, your purpose, if you've done that already, then look at this, write this down as well. Courage fellowship. 
the courage to serve. Oh, somebody, isn't that good? Jesus did what? He came to serve. Assuming responsibility. Now I'm writing your Kool-Aid. Notice number one was serve. Number two, assume responsibility. Challenge. Number three, challenge. Saints of God, let me stop there. There always and should be in your life a challenge. You should never rest on your laurels. The children of Israel tried that before God pressed them to go across the River Jordan. They wanted to remain in the wilderness, but I'm here to tell you, you're not to remain in the wilderness. Somebody say, I'm not going to stay in this wilderness, Pastor. Then you're going to be challenged. You know, the other thing is, so this challenge then, there has to be something new in your life that's going to be a risk factor. Oh, somebody, you're going to have to take risk. Life is a risk. You don't know whether you're going to be here tomorrow or not. So it's a risk for you to get up and go wherever you're going. It's a risk. So life is full of risk. You know, my wife, she works, I mean, she has these government type, con and there are so many laws and risk. So she has to be very meticulous about what she does and how she does it. So then, but there's a challenge in it that she must face every day. As we do all, we all have works and jobs that are very challenging, but if it, the challenge went there, then would it be worth the opportunity? Would it be worth the chance of you succeeding? Number four, participate in the transformation. Watch this. I've already, I spoke to some people last week and I spoke over them and the Holy Spirit said transition. Transition is when you are in a transition of where you're going, right? So you're transitioning and how you behave in the transition will allow you to transform. Notice participating in the transformation, write that down. But you are in a transition, come on somebody, you're being challenged to go forward. You're being challenged to participate in the transition so that you can be transformed. Who do we know that was transformed, but he was, had to go through a transition? Jesus Christ, he was transformed. And before he was actually transformed in his transition, he was transfigured. You need to get this. I'm trying to go right in the place where you've been and been trying to get out of in the spirit. The last one, number five, it says, take moral, notice, moral action, a good action. Take a good stance about what you're doing. Do what is good and right before you so it'll be well with you. God tells us all the time in Proverbs, the righteous, how the righteous should succeed. The righteous will trump, hallelujah, every time the wicked. The righteous, he talks about it all the time. He says that the righteous will live and succeed, but the wicked will perish and be destroyed. So take moral action toward whatever it is you're doing. Don't stop what you're doing, but apply, apply these same steps, these five things. And if you missed it, then you can get the recording, somebody. But write them down because what does Habakkuk say? Write the vision down and make it plain for yourself. And then watch it. Go back to it a few weeks and see, oh my God, see that it has happened. Understand that God loves it when you write to him and show him that you understand what the written word is about because all you're doing is imitating our Lord and Savior. What does Jesus always tell us? He tells you and then he says, it is written. It is written. So learn to write as well as communicate. Oh, somebody, what does the first thing they tell you on the qualifications for the job? We're looking for somebody who can communicate and write. You need to understand, I'm speaking right in everything you do because the word is true. The word is pure and clean. Oh, somebody, listen to me. So let's talk again about that courageous follower. You remember him? A courageous follower. A courageous follower has a foundation of a courageous relationship. A courageous follower has a clear and internal vision of service to God.
There it is. You know, when you serve God, there's a, there's a wonderful goodness about it, isn't it? It's a wonderful good fight of faith, but it's a goodness about it. It, 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 it penetrates the heart and mind. It's a mystery of how he does this when you begin to throw yourself at God. Oh, somebody, when you become a God chaser, it's a difference isn't it? It, it? it shows you it, it's blessings when they come. You, you have no clear understanding as to how, but you know that it was God. You, you, you knew that he, he did this for you. A courageous follower then has a clear internal, notice, vision, where are you going, of service to God. A courageous follower, oh somebody, remains fully accountable for their actions. Notice we talked about the value, the behavior. A courageous follower, re oh, somebody, remains fully accountable for their actions. In other words, stand up for whatever you do. Oh, my wife, I love her so much because she checks me. She tells me if I do something and if I make a decision and if I try to back out of it, the first thing she steps right up in my face and tell me, you made a decision, stick with it and go on and let God do it. What a revelation. Courageous followers then remain fully accountable for their actions while relinquishing autonomy. Let me stop there. A courageous follower remains fully accountable for their actions. So if you're courageous and you're following God, you have to be accountable. So you're accountable for your actions while relinquishing autonomy. What is autonomy, you might say? Independence. When you're trying to be independent of God, that's what autonomy is for those that did not know. So then you're relinquishing your independence and conceding certain authority to God. You remember I talked about some months back about how you receive authority from the author from the authoritator. The authoritator gives you the authority. The authoritator we know is God. So then you need to rele relinquish your autonomy, relinquish your independence, and concede to the authoritator. Concede to the leader. Notice, notice. Beliefs is what you're trying to accomplish through Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Your beliefs is what you're trying to accomplish through Jesus Christ. And watch this, you should work energetically, not slothful, not, not a little bit, but you should work energetically to this end. Let me, let me break that down just a little bit. Your beliefs is what you're trying to accomplish through Jesus Christ. Oh, somebody, when you're in the presence of God or you're pressing in, then whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever you have set your mind to, whatever goal, come on, whatever thing you are desiring to have in life, you should be doing that through Jesus Christ. Because if it comes any other way, there's going to be toil, strife. And there may not be the success that you were looking for. So stick with Jesus in this. Whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, you need to accomplish it through Jesus Christ. Notice you can't even get to the Father unless it's through the Son. <laughs> through Jesus Christ is the only way we can succeed. The only way we can achieve greatness is through Jesus Christ. Through Yeshua. So here's the thing. Believe in what you're trying to accomplish through him and work at it energetically to this end. No matter what it is or what it looks like, continue on the path. You understand now how to do that. So continue. In other words, you always want to get up and give God some praise. You always want to have a good face on you want to trust God, and even when things don't feel right, you don't look good, bad hair day, whatever it is, 
approach whatever you're getting ready to do energetically. Just say, devil, I shake you off in Jesus' name. I bind you up. I cast you behind me in the name of Jesus, and I am going to succeed and not fail. I'm going to win and not lose. I'm going to not die, but live to declare the works, the works of the Lord and the good works, the wonderful works of him or somebody. So when you begin to think of these wonderful things and God, you, you begin to know now that courage is right around the corner. I love the way God does this. Watch this with me. It just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Somebody say amen, pastor. Loyalty or loyalty of a follower. Loyalty of a follower. Listen to this. Loyalty of a follower. And let's go to Genesis nine and nine, and I'll put some scripture to that, but I want to tell you about the loyalty of a follower. And I behold, he says, and I behold, I establish my covenant. This is God talking to Noah. I establish my covenant with you, Noah, and with your seed after you. Notice he established a covenant with Noah and his seed. But then he comes along because Jesus is now here. So everything that happened in the situation with Noah and Ham, it's null and void because look what he says in Hebrews chapter 8, 13. He says, in that, he said, a new covenant. A new covenant because Jesus gave of what? He removed all sins. He forgave us all. He took away everything that was in our way. He removed it when he died up on the cross. But look at Hebrews 8, 13, he says, and that, he said, a new covenant. Now, a new covenant he is assigning with you and me. He has made the first old. Notice, he made the one with Noah old. Now that which decayeth and waxed old is ready to vanquish away. Now we have a new covenant. We don't need to be looking back, though the patriots teaches us a lot, a lot of things about our living God. But Jesus comes and saves us. Oh, somebody that is so good. Again, I could close the book right there, but it gets better. Because I want you to remember God's covenant as it is today, as it is this day on this wise. Both leader and followers are entering into a contract to pursue the common purpose within the context of God. Let me say that again. Remember God's covenant. If you're a leader or a follower, you are entering into a contract to pursue the common purpose within the context of God. God's what? Values. In other words, his behavior, his spear, the way Jesus is, that's what we're doing. We're entering into that type of behavior. The loyalty of the purpose is to help us stay true to that purpose. That's what a loyal follower is. And even when we make mistakes, come on, saints, get up and continue to press like Jesus. Continue to get up and follow him. Notice, this is for the leaders and the followers to enter into that purpose, to enter into that contract and be defined by those values. Joshua, again, Joshua talks about it again. This is God talking to Joshua in 1 and 7. He says, only be thou strong. <laughs> only sore. Strong. And you know, the thing about being strong and consistent, it's not about you doing anything. Do you notice, and I keep coming back to this eagle thing because I just looked at it, stared at it. And do you notice the eagle has very little movement in the air? Very, all he does is glide, he turns, but he does nothing. He may flap his wings very little. Your being strong is just being saying, I'm going to participate. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to fly. 
I'm going to just let God make me strong. I'm going to let him, I'm going to, I'm going to, somebody, I'm going to spread my wings and I'm going to look to him for the airways. I'm going to look for him for all the air pressure and all that stuff that goes along with it because I don't have to do anything except be strong in him. Trust him and be very courageous that I may observe to do accordingly all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not again to the right hand or to the left, for thy may it prosper whatsoever and wherever thy going. So see, trust, trust is one this way. How and you say, well, pastor, I need to, get God to begin to trust me. <laughs> you need to first trust yourself. Can you be trustworthy? This is no time to misbehave. What are your values? Why don't you take some time today and write down the word value and then define who you are. Define who your behavior is. Who and what you are. Oh, somebody just broke a yoke. So then this is no time, I say to you, to misbehave in whatever it is God has challenged you in. You are to pursue and persist. So how do we, how, do, how, how is trust won then? How, how is it won? To earn trust, we must go to great lengths to keep our word. There it is. God always keeps his word, doesn't he? And what I've been trying to get you to do is to look to God's promises, and then we learn how to keep our own promises. What I've been trying to get you to do is look to God's vow, and then we, we learn how to keep our own vows. And I've also said, don't make a vow unless you're sincere about keeping it. Don't say, God, I'm going to serve you, and then the first opportunity or the first setback in your life, you, you, you don't keep, keep the vow. You know, I learned that at an early, very early time, even before I came a minister, because I, I made some vows and God brought it back to my remembrance and I was corrected. And then I got on track and I says, okay, God, I, I see. I understand. You know, to me, integrity is important. That's the anointing I, I believe God gave me. And if I cross that line, believe me, he shows up right there in my face. I love the Lord because he's such a wonderful, loving father. So I try very, very hard to keep my word. If I say it, I have to do it. And of course, my wife makes sure of it. <laughs> so to earn trust, then we must go to great lengths to keep our word. And... If we cannot keep it, we must communicate this as soon as possible. A clear, simple example of that. If you cannot keep your word, a clear example in terms of repenting is good. But the example would be if you told somebody you were going to be somewhere on time, and you found yourself in traffic or you found yourself running late, whatever the reason is, the right thing to do is to communicate that to that person or to the company or whoever it is you have given your word to. You communicate that and say, hey, I'm, going, I'm not going to be on that particular time. This is helping somebody. I know it is because you know you run late all the time and you don't even keep your word. You don't even do the most courageous thing and the most courteous thing by simply picking up the phone and says, hey, I'm going to be late or text, whatever it is, to let that person know that you are a person of integrity and you're going to keep your word. God requires us to do this all the time. It's called repentance. You see this? You see how we're bringing this right into your home, right into your sphere, right into your life. Do you understand? So then trust is a stable state between two people formed from an assessment of each other's internal motives and external actions. Let me say that again. Trust is stability. Trust is a stable state between two people 
formed from an assessment of each other's internal motives and external actions. Because if I'm telling my wife, if I'm telling, I'm not using her as an example today because she's the closest thing to me, so I can use her as an example. If I say something, again, my motives and my internal actions must represent that. Because not only that, God is looking at all of us. So our internal actions and what we think and what we do. So what you're thinking and what you do should line up and be the same. God is looking at that. This is what you must answer to. Not so much us or me, but you must answer to God in like manner. Again, trust is a stable state between two people formed from an assessment of each other's internal motives and external actions. You, you, you've been around some shady people, amen? And you know you couldn't trust them, you know? My, I used to do, I used to have a little mantra that I would do. If somebody asked me for to loan them some money, I said, well, okay, what I'm going to do, I, and I don't loan people money. If I usually just, if I have it, I'll give it to them. But in the old days, I did a test, you know, I'd say, well, no, I don't have that amount to give you. And I didn't. I said, but I'll trust you with this amount. And that'll be a, a lot lesser amount. And I would wait, and then if, if the person never showed up around, and a lot of times those same people, if they owe you, they would dodge you and wouldn't come around. That's how you can tell a friend or not. Give them some money. <laughs> and they'll run, and they won't show up anymore. You don't have to worry about that one. But anyway, that's another story. But you understand what I'm saying. Again, a stable person between two people. It's, 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 you build, it's an assessment of one another. You know, it's, it's just like a marriage, it, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm using this as a scenario because it's a, it's a good example. I'm sure my wife, she did, she, she assessed me. And, and I'm sure when you have a spouse or whatever, before you got it, you tried or attempted to assess them, but did, when you assessed them, you didn't have the counsel of God. This is one thing I can say when I assessed it, my wife, I had the counsel of God. I, I knew, and I tell her all the time, and she just gets tired of hearing it. I tell her, I says, I, I knew what I wanted. I, I, you are exactly what I had asked God for. I didn't deviate. I, I wrote it down. Do you hear me? I wrote my vision down. And the woman, she, she showed up at my door. Oh, somebody. And she never knew, never knew. But nevertheless, here's what I'm trying to say. Write the vision down. If you are looking for a spouse, and your know, Pastor Darlene preached to you women about this, and I preach to the men, I tell them, write the vision down of what you're expecting in a woman. And even, and, and women, and what you're expecting, especially in a man. And you do not want that to deviate. If it's a deviation, it's a camouflage of the devil, and you need to rebuke that devil in the name of Jesus. So I'm trying to get you to begin to assess internal values, internal motives, and external actions. They should line up. That's what trust really is. If either, watch this, if either of them are questionable, questionable, trust does not jail well. Love cannot move in. Trust won't jail well if these two factors or not in place. Oh, somebody. I know, I know this is good. I, I, I feel it in my spirit. Let's get some word on all of this. Let's talk about courage. And this is what I was talking about, risk. Life is a risk. Whatever we do is a risk. We know the stock market, whether you're Bitcoin or whatever it is, it's a risk. They tell you that most most good investors or subscribers will tell you from the jump. If you don't have it to invest, don't do it. Don't use your bill money to invest. You don't do that. It's not wisdom. So, but everything we do in life is a risk. And you say, how so, Pastor? Well, the food we eat, we bless it so it won't be detrimental to us. 
everything we do with the sports we play is a risk of getting hurt. We see that every day. So life is a risk. Courage then implies risk. Let's look at let's look at first Chronicles 19 and 13. And here we are 